It's a past to the hour time for our newsroom conversation. But before we get into it, the National Integrity Alliance will this morning present to the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission and other members of the Chapter 6 Working Group a list of 20 political aspirants who should be barred from running from office in the August general elections due to lack of integrity. According to the Alliance, the list has been drawn up after an objective and impartial investigation into their track record in the public service. The Alliance will be seeking the industry of the IABC and the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission not to clear the 20 aspirants. Well, let's look at some of the elements that should guide the integrity checks in line with Chapter 6 of the Constitution just before we get into our conversation. And as we speak, there are six agencies that are mandated here to clock out uh, the politicians who have questions of integrity against them. And uh, those six commissions include the Commission for University Education. We also have the Office of the Attorney General, as well as the Office of the Director of uh, Public uh, Prosecutions. Uh, we also have uh, the Department of Immigration and uh, Registration of Persons, as well as the Director of uh, Criminal Investigations. But the one most tasked with this uh, is the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. They are coming in six. Uh, it is tasked with uh, clearing uh, the 15,082 uh, aspirants for the August the eighth elections and as it is there they are um, 15,083 names rather have been submitted by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission and these are six agencies that are mandated with giving recommendations are expected to do that for each of the candidates uh, by Thursday that is close of business tomorrow so we are watching and waiting uh, to see those recommendations and of course we've been speaking to constitutional lawyer Harrison Kinyanju in just a few moments ago and he is questioning uh, the capacity capacity of these uh, agencies really to give recommendations for 15,000 plus uh, political aspirants and the checklist now that these six agencies will be looking at each political aspirant must have a valid and genuine university degree and uh, valid and genuine there being the key word and they must not have violated section 13 of the leadership and integrity act that will be discussed in a bit more detail in our newsroom conversation but the aspirants must also be Kenyan citizens for at least 10 years and not hold dual citizenship. And this is even more strict for presidential candidates here because presidential candidates must be Kenyan citizens by birth and not any other process, naturalization or um, registration. And uh, of also um, in terms of uh, for the presidential candidates and all other aspirants, they must not have been imprisoned for at least six months within the period of investigation. So um, we might see a few of the aspirants there uh, finding themselves in a tough situation when it comes to that. And of course, lastly and very importantly, should not have contravened Chapter 6 of the Constitution. And this is the controversial uh, Chapter 6 of the Constitution. There's been a lot of questions as to the interpretation of this chapter and uh, whether it has been implemented right as was envisioned in the Constitution. Now, as we speak, we have the Kenya National Commission of Human Rights, which has moved to the Supreme Court, asking it to interpret the guidelines of Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Um, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights has moved straight to the Apex Court, saying that they feel that the Court of Appeal and the High Court have shied away from interpreting this Constitution. Um, but of course, as we speak, we also have lawyer Okio Mtata, who's opposed that case by the KNHCR, saying that he has filed a similar case before the High Court that is yet to be dealt with. And so the rights body is filing a case seeking to bar leaders of questionable integrity from contesting on August the 8th. Now, of course, should the Supreme Court give its decision on this issue, that decision will be final and that might lock out quite a few political aspirants. So a little reason to worry here for those political aspirants because the decision of the Supreme Court will be final. So that is a checklist for integrity the tests of integrity for the 15,083 political aspirants. Let's now delve into our newsroom conversation. Mike will be driving this, but for now, our panelists in studio. Thank you very much, Michelle. And straight to introducing the panel that we have this morning. And I'll start with Kokyo Ching, who is a lecturer at USIU Media and Journalism. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. To my extreme left, we have Alphonse Shiundu, who is from Kenya, editor for Africa Check. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank and you. last but not 
not least, we have uh, Eric Latif, who is a journalist. Thank you for joining us this morning. Now, morning, this question of integrity, of course, coming up again and again and again. Here we are now heading towards the August 8th election, and uh, we had uh, Raquel Mwigai, one of our reporters in town, just basically asking Kenyans, what do you think of uh, our, our leaders and whether they pass the integrity test? And even names were being thrown out there. So let me start with you, Koki. In terms of, first of all, defining what Chapter 6 means, have we done that? Secondly, have we asked the right questions when it comes to our leaders who are seeking elective seats who would probably not qualify according to the Court of uh, Public uh, Justice, would not qualify, whether we have done that well? <laughs> I think, uh, first of all, congratulations this morning. I've seen uh, very much, uh, I'm very impressed with the, what are you calling it? Uh, the, the, the super wall and the details yeah, the of super what wall. It is super. <laughs> I, I think you're now moving towards the right direction as Thank media. You. Thank you. And basically, we are seeing that uh, media literacy about these things is increasing. The way to look at uh, ethics is basically um, from, of course, a legal perspective where it's described in terms of what should happen and what shouldn't happen. It's more prescriptive in nature. So uh, many people who are aspiring can argue that uh, if they are to go through the legal process to the end, then it will justify their innocence. Mm -hmm. So of course, Kenyans are not in that arena. It is a, you've just talked to a lawyer who understands the process. The legal. Yeah, bit of it. But uh, from... Um, the public sphere, you have people who are giving descriptive ethical standards according to their perception. Mm. We know that uh, uh, the, uh, people have values, beliefs, and the way they look at things. So for, for me, uh, a normal Kenyan, if I hear that you've done something wrong and uh, it is justifiable, it might not be true, but it seems to align my reasoning to the fact that you're guilty, mm -hmm. then you're guilty as charged mm -hmm. in the public eyes. But that doesn't cut you off from the processes as a leader uh, because you also have that legal backing to your position. All right, Eric, uh, they say, especially in politics, that perception is reality. Yes. And uh, but <laughs> politics is really about perception. And the perception of many Kenyans is that our leaders probably do not pass that test. How do we balance between, in terms of informing, because that's our job, is, uh, mm -hmm. that's it, we, we fact check. Uh, how do we ensure that the public is clear that there is a difference between what you feel and think and what is a fact on the ground? I think the media has done that bit of the job in terms of, you know, saying, highlighting the issues that uh, bring question to somebody's integrity and ethics and also putting that into perspective with the laws. Uh, and, and, you know, Michelle has just been quoting them, uh, the Chapter 6 of the Constitution, the Leadership and Integrity Act, all these matters have been discussed and have been highlighted by the media so many times. But like Koki is saying, the biggest agency of all those agencies that have been named there, the one that we missed, is the voter. The voter mm. is the biggest agency. And if the voter does not feel that you have violated any ethics or inter integrity, then they will elect you. And that's where the problem comes in. Mm -hmm. Is the voter uh, aligned to their own internal interpretation of ethics or not? Because if a voter is, then I, as you said, Perception is the biggest, is, is reality, it's reality. <laughs> in this politics. Mm -hmm. If the reality is a leader is elected, then that means that the perception uh, about that leader is that they are okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, the, that's where the issue is. I don't think it's about the media not highlighting the issues. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the media not even ra raising that debate on somebody's integrity, somebody's ethics. It's about, at the end of the day, is, is the voter really feeling that they have elevated their own levels of ethics and integrity, their own cutoff points? Mm -hmm. Has the voter um, implemented that? Because when they go to the ballot, that's but many times that decision. can also be a very dangerous situation because it's not the first time that we've seen leaders um, who have even been declared by the court as unfit to serve in a political office still get elected into public office by the same Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And so um, using the voter as this agency is a very tricky situation <laughs> when you look at it. It's tricky, but you see, at the end of the day, in an election process, the one person, the only person who's given a, uh, an opportunity to decide is the voter. Mm -hmm. yes. Everybody else follows the whims of the voter. Mm -hmm. So if the voter has decided that, no, I want this person, then that's what happens. That's what happens. In Liberia, we had uh, Ellen Johnson Salif burned, burned by the, 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 their commission 
uh, what was it, the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission, mm -hmm. uh, and yet she Still. is the president. Uh, let, let, let me come to Alphonse, because you deal with fact-checking uh, with Kenya Editor for Africa Check. How, how well are we doing in terms of literally, and, and maybe let's start with the process of uh, having facts and figures on one side, because I remember a time when the newspaper was your to go to when mm -hmm. it comes to facts. Everybody out there can say whatever they want. But the minute you held that newspaper, this became fact. But is, do you think that is still where we are today? Do you think that is changing? Are we doing our job well enough when it comes to ensuring that before we publicize or publish anything, it is factual? All right. Uh, just to join this debate about integrity and fact-checking, mm -hmm. uh, there is an element where we have to understand ab initio that it is not the media's job to convict people. Correct. Yes. So the job of the media is to give information out there truthfully and as with all the facts. Uh, we, we usually say there are three sides to the lion story. Mm -hmm. Your side, my side, and then the truth. So you, you, you just have to stick to the truth. Mm. So media, especially in Kenya, when, when it comes to giving information about politics, uh, there is a huge improvement. The only problem is with the dissemination of that information. Uh, for example, uh, when, when a politician comes here, you're interviewing the politician. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the background uh, information about what that person is speaking about, then it becomes a challenge to stop that politician when they say something. Uh, they, they can literally just go wild with whatever they want yeah. With whatever. And, and you've seen some of them, like when we are fact-checking these reports, you find somebody is standing in, in a very uh, important event, say the State of the Nation address, mm -hmm. and he makes a claim there. And the belief, the understanding, is that when that person is speaking on such a platform, everything has been checked and rechecked and is truthful. So we have the luxury, which newsrooms don't have, of time and access. We, we, we actually based at the Aga Khan University of uh, Graduate School of Media and Communication. So we have access to these experts and we have access to their resources. And when we sit down after some time and go through this data, the, as we check the claims, you find that some of them are wildly untrue. <laughs> and you, you just have to point that out. Mm -hmm. and, 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 so, and maybe sticking yes. to the political arena, because that's the season that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've mentioned the State of the Nation address. And we've had quite a number of uh, leaders stand up and make claims and say, you know, things that we can check, we can fact check. Because there's a difference between a leader giving their manifesto and saying, this is what we'll do, mm -hmm. and another leader standing up and saying, this is what we have done. From your assessment, have we been thorough enough in fact-checking. Let's take, for instance, just a simple thing that all of us will remember, the May scandal. There was question as to when it, uh, it was gazetted. Uh, you look at the time that it took for it to uh, leave Mexico, or was it South Africa? There was all that, and it got here. Your uh, assessment of how we have done in terms of giving the public facts as they are. Forget about the politics around it, but just the facts. There is, there is the political... We actually looked at this last week. There is the political rhetoric around it, where people say, oh, this thing was just announced last week, and five days later, the maze is here. Mm -hmm. So we went back and looked at the Gazette notices. Then we realized on April 13th, there was a Gazette notice by the Cabinet Secretary of uh, the National Treasury, mm -hmm. saying that, uh, telling Millers, uh, you can, 22, actually 22 millers to import yellow maize for foodstuff, for animal feed. Then any person to import maize for the white maize. So we sat down and went a bit back. Then we found in the budget speech, mm -hmm. Rotich actually mentioned it, that he's going to allow people to import maize duty-free for four months until July 31st. <laughs> and 
for uh, four months, uh, five months until July 31st. For, that's for white, or August 31st mm -hmm. for white maize. So, and we still went back and found that on 23rd of uh, March, the cabinet secretary for agriculture, Willie Bett, was telling people that he's negotiating with the treasury with a view to getting that maize imported in Kenya. So when you move forward and you, and you hear the politicians saying this thing uh, was just announced recently, we went and we found that it was a statement from KRA, which was released on May 4, uh, advising millers. It was simply quoting, making public the okay. teaching. Maybe, the maybe so that we try and shorten it. Question yes. would be, given the facts, you did the fact yeah. checking, you've done the background, you've checked, yes. uh, and given the politics, because there's a politics side of it. Politicians will come out and say that it was announced today in five days, we have Kwan uh, Unga, you know, there's, there's all that. Um, was it factual? It was, it was, it was, was not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, at Africa Tech, we have these uh, this ratings. Mm -hmm. we, we don't say false or true. Mm -hmm. we, we say it's correct incorrect. or it's not correct. Incorrect. Okay. Yes. So <laughs> or misleading. We, or misleading <laughs> or understated. Uh, yeah. So we, we just say it is, it is not correct to say the, uh, that the maize came here with the... Uh, that, that they, uh, the maize arrived in five days. That the Gazette notice, mm -hmm. between the period between the issuing of the Gazette notice mm -hmm. and the arrival of the maize was five days. Mm -hmm. That was incorrect. So mm -hmm. that's what the facts are. That's we, the, we, mm -hmm. yes. uh, Koki, now looking at a case <laughs> like this and looking at the detail that they had to go into, that is meant to be, in a way, what mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. Do we have the capacity, number one? Number two, do we need a special desk that maybe links to him and literally just does this within record time? I think I've talked about this severally uh, every time I come here. The element of research, having people dedicated to make sure that stories are solidified mm -hmm. and they are based on facts uh, so that the public logic that runs around in the... Um, in the social media does not really cloud our minds. And our reporting, yes, could bring to forth something that is uh, as genuine as it is, but uh, the follow-up uh, to that story needs to have more angles and more sources. Mm. So for me, I think it's an added advantage if you have linkages with organizations as such mm -hmm. that give you data that you can really help to solidify the content okay. of the story. And Koki is speaking from the authority of a lecturer. And it's mm. easy, yeah, it's different when you're a lecturer. <laughs> yeah. But Eric, you've been on the ground. Here you are sometimes, uh, the deputy president has announced and said that, you know, there's this maze coming, there's all this happening, but you need a story by the end of the day that needs to mm. go on prime time or whatever time that you're doing that. Mm. How practical is it? You know, if you had a functional research desk yeah. and a functional research department. Always before a story goes out, there's all these kind of meetings and, and fact-checking uh, processes. There's an editorial meeting. There are meetings where people sit and discuss the story, especially a big story. And if you had a functional research department uh, that has the benefit of uh, all the data with them, then they have done this kind of background checks before. Uh -huh. And, you know, they'll point out and say, no, 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 I remember we had this kind of story last week. Mm. And I remember when we had the Gazette notice by uh, the, T the, the Treasury CS, or I remember when the CS Agriculture mentioned this, I remember, I remember. Uh -huh. There has to be that kind of, you know, um, help coming in uh -huh. from, from a department that is dealing with data and information. Uh -huh. And I think if we had... Uh, functional research departments. I know Koki has said this many times. I've also come and said, I mean, I, it's, it's about investing in the right things. And yeah. if uh, newsrooms just invested in a little bit more research uh, and, and saying, if you're pursuing a big story, then we have to go into better research on it, looking back at the background, the information, uh, fact-checking uh, and cross-checking, mm -hmm. then it would help. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do that, but think... the benefit here is that you have a, re you have a reporter who's covered this story over this uh, period of time, mm -hmm. and that's the one you're relying on mm -hmm. to tell you, it no, wait, where will you find your uh, uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, 
what, what so they expect that, you know, I think it would yeah. help a lot also in mm. um, intensifying or enhancing media's role in making leaders accountable. Because yes. when we have such research desks and such facts, then mm. when um, authoritative figures, I mean, so when Raila Odinga says something in Kisumu, then it becomes law. Mm. But when somebody so authoritative stands in front of a crowd and says something, as media, we're able to go back mm -hmm. years to this is what you said then. And this mm. is a very different change of script now. So it helps them become more accountable because I feel for now the only research we rely on is Raila said this today. Yesterday, what did he say? It's not, yeah. um, you know, it's not very a lot of follow-up being being yeah. done there. And I think media need really. I've said it before, um, maybe a year or two back. Something about uh, restructuring uh, your business uh, model to more to think more about mm -hmm. content as a product mm -hmm. that you can sell. And therefore, if you invest more time in research and in, in building the stories from different angles and from different sources, then you're likely to be selling the content and not depending so much on advertisement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because then your content is believed, it is niche-based, it will target the right people, and uh, will come to you first. We don't have to go to social media. Okay, then, Koki, the question would be, we are investing, and I know you're, you're sitting on the desk lecturing mm -hmm. and churning out potential reporters and people who are coming into uh, this, uh, the newsrooms. What is it that we're looking for when it comes to uh, researchers? Do we have people who really have that in them? Do, mm -hmm. Is there space for that? I think... Uh, also to go along with the change in the business model will also determine the changes in curriculum. Mm -hmm. For example, at USRU, we are due for review. So when we are looking at what is, what is the trend globally, and if you look at the trend globally, most of uh, some of the positions as they are will be redundant because you want to have people who are content editors, who are liaisons with communities, who people who, people who follow through facts and researchers. Mm. So it is more about rethinking, mm -hmm. again, uh, the training models, mm -hmm. because we want to ensure that when we bring out a journalist, he's reflective of what the modern trend is. All right, so let, me hand, let me hand a barb to Koki and the Academia. You know, saying that the, the media houses are the ones that are going to shape how you actually mm -hmm. uh, come up with your curriculum is also not, I think, the right way. Mm -hmm. I think if you started from academia and, and help to assist, not help to assist, yeah. help, <laughs> help, to. Help, help the media houses in, in thinking this way, because you're saying, mm -hmm. look, this is a kind of, uh, we, we sit down as academia, we research, we mm -hmm. look at uh, global trends, we have, you have all this data, yeah. and that's what you do. Mm -hmm. Then you come and tell us, uh, as a standard group, this is where the uh, news business is going. This is where information mm. business is going. Okay. Model yourselves this way. We have already started creating departments or faculties or you know, small departments and training this kind of people mm -hmm. to come and fit your new model. Or we have already trained people who have uh, well versed in research. Mm -hmm. Or Because I think sometimes the people who are coming out of universities are coming out of universities, just coming uh, and, and what their main uh, purpose is, is to come and serve in the newsroom, to come and be on air, to come, you know, mm -hmm. they, they don't have much. And you will you'll understand <laughs> True. it. True. And, and unfortunately, yeah. you'll, you'll find... You're dealing even, with new people yeah. who you have to start teaching them how to write an intro to a story. And, and, and uh, even away from that, if you look at majority of our news gathering technique, if I can call it that, mm. you'll find it. To go for a press conference, you have all these mics right there, mm. and all we go back to the newsroom is so-and-so said. Yes. Nobody mm. goes back to look at what, uh, what exactly is that coming from. And maybe, Alphonse, you'll agree with me, because right now, fake news is becoming a big thing, to a point where the, I believe you're also aware there's conversations of trying to identify how you can, first of all, identify fake news, how you can uh, deal with fake news, because in this day and age of social media, uh, the tweets and, you know, Facebook and all, Instagram, the news is going ahead of the newsroom, as it were. So we need to go back and do the fact-checking. Now, first of all, maybe just to let us know and bring us up to speed, what is going on in in, uh, your circles of uh, looking for facts and figures when it comes to fake news? Okay, at uh, Africa Tech is part of an organization called the International Fact Checking Network. So this organization uh, has 18 verified uh, fact checking organizations, including PolitiFact, the Washington Post Fact Checker, Africa Check. Uh, it's a whole, whole list of organizations around the world. So what 
we do. Uh, the reason why it's there, it's hosted by the Pointer, Inst uh, Pointer Institute. So the reason why we are there is we, we come together as, as, as fact checkers to set standards on what needs to be, uh, uh, what a fact checker needs. Mm -hmm. So there are standards about transparency of sources of your methodology, of the source of your funding. Mm -hmm. There are uh, non-partisanship and independence and declaring how your organization is set up. Mm -hmm. So Facebook and Google uh, sort of rely on this organization to do third party fact checks. So for, for example, if you search something, say a myth that has been busted by any of these organizations, mm -hmm. it pops up on Google as uh, fact checked. Uh, it shows the fact check and the fact check determined that this is either correct or incorrect, mm -hmm. or it's either true or false, depending on the rankings of whichever fact checker uh, use that. So in, in terms of fake news, we also at Africa Check have guides so how to spot fake news online. And we have done this with KTN before on, on Checkpoint, where we, we tried to create a fake tweet <laughs> and see how that flows. Mm. So we created the fake tweet and it was retweeted. People took screenshots and shared it on Telegram and WhatsApp. And by the time we were coming to say, oh, this was this fake, was fake it had already <laughs> gone. And that's especially <laughs> important <laughs> because yeah. especially yes. in this electioneering period, social media plays such a big role. I remember in last year in South Sudan, um, the conflict was reignited, allegedly following a Facebook post by one of the ministers. But then the said minister came out and said that was not his Facebook page. But then the page had thousands of followers and it looked mm -hmm. like his page. So in this day and age, especially where we have politicians also making statements on social media and journalists being the first people to retweet those very statements, mm -hmm. how can we tell if this is a right account or not? Mm -hmm. All right. There, there are telltale signs on understanding if something is, uh, is, is, is the right account. So let's go to Facebook and, uh, and Twitter. They all have that verified The verified sign. account. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now you... Which, which is a blue thing for which, somebody who might not know. It yes, has yes. Blue. It's a, it's a, it has a blue tick. Mm -hmm. So if the first thing you do is look at that. Sometimes they are parody accounts yeah. that are verified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So you have to look at the tweets and try and assess if... Because these parody accounts tweet very outrageous yeah. statements. So intentionally. You, in, intentionally. So you, yeah. what, what you do, you, you try to juxtapose it with the coverage in the, news, in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And then you will notice that, hey, for example, if somebody tweets that, yeah, we're going to boycott elections. <laughs> And that statement has not been said, say, if it's Jubilee. I'm just giving an example. Mm. So if Jubilee tweets that we're going to boycott the elections, they have never said that. So that's something you, you just... And, you can and, fact check. You okay. can fact check. Mm -hmm. And, and they, 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 just this last point. Mm -hmm. For journalists, the onus is on you to verify everything. Yeah. It doesn't take much. The, the old school journalism that we, uh, when uh, I just left the newsroom recently, mm -hmm. so, and I still write as a, as a journalist. Mm -hmm. So when I see something and I think it's outrageous, I have to call. You just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, man, I can see your tweet. You're saying this and it looks off. Is this you? Did you and, say that? Yes, mm -hmm. and somebody will say, no, that is, that is someone who stole my well, identity. The case is when you call to verify and the person yes. is unavailable or don't pick their calls, and you still need to give your story at the end of the day. <laughs> or, how, I, I mean, sometimes they may you, even say they did not tweet it yet. They did, they did. Yeah. because they don't want you to quote that, yes, I called him and he said that. But Eric, maybe the race that we have right now in the newsrooms, given that, first of all, we're running behind social media. Mm -hmm. Social media is always so quick to break things. I mean, we've even had instances where you have a video that has been sent out and they say please beware there is thugs on this 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 on road this only to discover that this is actually South Africa yeah. something you know not even <laughs> <talk about. laughs> but maybe the race that we have right now to ensure that we stick to the facts and that we are able to publish that and be factual but still on time it's because very, time, we are racing against time it's very interesting times we are living in because Bartok has found a channel mm. and that channel is big
<laughs> and it's bigger than um, every other ordinary media. Now, that race, uh, and I think that's where the, the issue of uh, knowing your staff comes in, okay. is um, if you if you start if you look at, for example, the, the video clip that's been sent, and you know, and you can see this is one of the uh, foot bridges. No, this is not a foot bridge. This is actually a flyover. But this flyover has an extra lane on the side. Then you start questioning the detail, the small the little details, small little details. Then you'll actually now start questioning and, and going further. If we stick to what journalism should should always be, that before you report, cross check. Okay. Yeah. Before you report, verify, cross check. Make sure that you know what you're saying. Then we'll be safe. Mm. Because this race for telling the the the, 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 the story fast should not be happening the way it is happening. It should be the race to tell the actual story, the factual story first. Yes. Now, and I, I, Michelle even mentioned it, so you've seen uh, some funny tweet from some funny account that looks like the actual account. For example, William Ruto has, there's a parody account for oh. William Ruto that, you know, looks completely like... It has thousands like, of just, followers. You just need to point out where is the S? You know, <laughs> is it William S. Ruto? Or is it William Ruto? Is it double L or is it single L? Some of those details. Once you start knowing that actually the, the actual tweet handle for this person is this one, then you are safe. And that's where you're coming in, into fact checking. Before you start retweeting or before you report it or before, let somebody else go ahead and report. We've heard of cases where people have actually picked uh, information from the rumor mill and gone ahead and reported, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be completely false. Mm -hmm. You have announced that somebody is dead and somebody is not dead, yeah. you know, and that has happened many times. So it's it's a very thin line. It's a thin line. But I think mm -hmm. it's just that thing of standing by saying I'm gonna be the proper journalist that I am, okay. and yeah. we've got to be the media house that we are, and we are gonna be telling the facts. Yeah. Right. Facts, first to the facts. Uh, I, I want to maybe uh, to respond to Eric's response about academia. I think uh, just coming out in the morning to, to the show to talk about these things is one of the it's ways we are, <laughs> <laughs> we are trying. Uh, generally, like I said, uh, academia is normally introverted. As, a, as in, nature. in nature. And uh, most of the time we do our research and maybe we put it in publications that, not, uh, that are not read. That but a good way, yeah, I shared <laughs> my peers. But a good way of working together would be like uh, some PR agencies do. They make us do position papers about an issue and we can share that with you or even just have workshops that we can be invited to talk to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are willing to, to change the outlook of media. Okay. Fake news is just. Uh, something about the history of journalism. It always started with yellow journalism. It's not new. It's not mm. new. Mm. Now, the challenge for the media is not to, like he said, to tell the story fact, but to check the facts. Because research shows that in spite of having that public space on social media, people still trust mainstream media. So I, I think the, the, the struggle with the media uh, you know, uh, thinking they are no longer mm -hmm. relevant is out, uh, utterly, totally out of the way. Mm -hmm. Because we have these online critiques and online uh, citizen journalists who still don't have the skills that you have. So I don't think that it should be an issue of, uh, oh, we are lagging behind. It should be an issue of we actually check and tell the truth. Okay. The problem comes also in the fake news <laughs> is when the mainstream media sets up a branch called uh, yes. to do, you know, oh, yes. uh, alternative, alternative journalism. journalism. Yeah. Uh -huh. Set up by the mainstream media. So yeah. they, that thin line also confusing. starts, just yeah. starts yeah. confusing mm -hmm. because you have a reputable media house mm -hmm. called The Standard and then it has this other publication that does uh, this kind of uh, other story. So you're wondering, so is it the same? And surprisingly, uh, that very media is very fast to, to bring in gender biases, talking about media, women personalities yes. or men personalities, giving that private life that we should not really know about. And that creates disparity in the minds of the audiences as to what we should think about the media. Okay, hold that thought because we want to <laughs> offload uh, our, uh, the home channel and that's KTN Home which is going to change over now to life and style. For those of us on KTN News, we continue with this conversation in the newsroom. Remember, you're welcome to participate and let us know what your thoughts are via social media, via Twitter, and uh, we'll be reading and sampling some of your comments as we carry on. But for now, we'd like to say goodbye to KTN Home for life and style to begin.
All right, Alphonse, bringing you now before we conclude on fake news. From your experience, roughly how long does it take to actually have this process of verifying? You've already given us some very, very basic ways of checking. Sometimes it's a spelling. Sometimes it could just be the picture that is used. There, there could be small little things that we can do uh, to check. But roughly for you to have credible information, how long does that take? Because, again, I go back to the fact that we are racing against time. Okay, it, uh, it usually depends. When we started as Africa Tech, we, was, uh, we, we started from zero. So we were getting this data from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, uh, going, talking to experts and collecting that data and putting it in a database. So it, it will take up to two weeks. But then we now have, uh, I would call it a data bank of where, data. Or, or, yes, or we have checked most of the claims that are being repeated, claims on debt, claims on electricity, power connections, claims on um, what, water, so are your fact so, checks mainly just political statements that I'm No, no, we check health statements. We check the, the aim of Africa Check and what we do, we, check, we, we try to keep public debate honest on anything. So if, if somebody says, like, <laughs> if somebody says, like, uh, we, if, you, if you drink lemon, for example, it helps oxidize and, <laughs> and do something to your stomach and mm. to your liver. Mm. So we, we, we check that. You talk to dietitians and they tell you that's rubbish. So Is it? It, it? It's, it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll see after the show. We, yes, we, we check that. So we, we found no evidence uh, that we, we are mainly looking for evidence to corroborate something. So we, once we find that we have evidence to corroborate what you're saying, and we don't claim to understand everything. Sometimes we look at the, uh, a fact check, we read, get the data. Now you have the data, you have the fact check, you have the context, but you still can't break it down because the Completely. aim is not, is not to speak mm. to other fact checkers. The aim okay. is to, to speak to the wider public. Mm -hmm. So we try as much as possible to break it down in the same journalistic language so that it's consumed widely. It's palatable and to everybody. Yes, and our All right, Koki, okay, let me come to something else now mm -hmm. as we are getting uh, to the uh, tail end of this particular segment. And this is to do with the voter verification because that's another big story that mm -hmm. we have that's uh, playing out right there. Your thoughts on whether we have been out there and literally let people know how important one it is to have this voter verification because it has an effect should we go to the august election and their claims mm -hmm. that people didn't vote when they were supposed to this is the time to do that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yes. this is your csr actually you should mm -hmm. put it on every <laughs> you know and every uh, strip of uh, news uh, mm -hmm. just put it there because really people are not doing it and uh, since i iebc is so bogged down with so many things. I think in terms of public interest, you can be able to put in a word or two every other time. Because it's, uh, you can partake media advocacy and inform people that you need to go and check uh, whether you're on the voters list and ETC. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, it's assumed that voters will be proactive. And yeah, out. it is proactive. But, but it's it's also an opportunity for media to come up and stomp its yeah. authority because we've had all these allegations or we only follow what the politicians say. And yeah. as we speak with this water verification exercise, um, we have a divide in the politicians. There are those who say those uh, politicians who are forcing their supporters to go verify their votes mm. are only those who don't trust IABC. Some of us have, yesterday we had a politician here who said, I don't think it's a big issue. It's a non-issue. I mean, yeah. I trust the IABC. Why go register my vote? I mean, verify my vote. And this is somebody who has a following looking up to him and they're likely to do the same thing. So yeah. with these differing opinions from the political class, it is a time when media can come out and set their agenda Yes, and, and it is, it really is, it is of public interest mm. that people learn and it is important that the public learns their role in participation. Mm -hmm. The constitution outlines how public participation should be undertaken. Mm. And one of them is going through the electoral process, which means the tiring uh, you know, exercise of going to all these places, making sure you change your location of voting, making sure your name is on the list, making sure you have uh, important uh, documents and voting. We can see the effect already in some of those counties during the nomination. And uh, there's a tsunami coming, and I can tell you for sure. Mm. Mm -hmm. Eric, your thoughts on uh, how we've basically made uh, aware people aware of the voter verification, its importance, and not just voter verification, but the fact that should we not do our job right now, there's a potential there's a of potential. having violence, yes. And we could take some blame for it. Yeah, I think it's very important, like Koki is saying. It's, it's, um, 
what and, and Michelle is saying it, it's it's the role that media now should take to be the leader okay. and ensure the importance of these things. It's the importance of and how short uh, a time it takes just to go and get yourself verified. It takes less than five minutes. Just go there and you say, this is my polling booth. You give your ID, they key in so that it's faster for them to check. Mm -hmm. And then you put your thumbprint, verified, done. Mm -hmm. And you're very sure that this is where I'm going to come and vote. Yeah. It's, it's important to actually explain to people why you do that. Uh, but you know the stories that sometimes are seen in the media is the story of someone of just the confusion. And then and that's the mm. story that's being amplified. I mean, I'm going to go to Cambodia, and I'm going to go up and end up with a pandemic, and I'm going to end up with a casino, and I'm going to end up with a You know, and that, when you're sitting there and you're watching, you're like, I don't Why don't don't you that. tell them? Yeah. yeah, that means I need to. And that yeah. makes one case out of the many that are actually yeah. going through. By the yes. way, just by putting the numbers I can see on the screen, 75 days makes me just aware and prepared mm -hmm. that something is going to happen and In something, some change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, media has that leeway mm -hmm. because you are in the public sphere to tell that different side of the story for public information. All right, Alphonse, as we conclude and maybe your closing comments and uh, also to ask you, your organization and such organizations, how much access do the public or anybody who would want those facts have to you? All right, we... I will answer the second part, then go to the first part. Okay. So about access, our content is free. Uh, as long as you are credited, that you got it from Africa Tech, mm -hmm. and we publish online and we send we we send to media houses. So the cost element is just say the access to the internet, mm -hmm. but we, we we try to circulate our product as widely as possible. Then coming to the voter verification question, mm -hmm. uh, you've seen. Politicians, I think uh, l last week and this week, uh, last weekend, where politicians were saying, we're coming to verify. You registered us, just all we need is to show up and you have our biometrics. We will do the biometrics. Once we are identified, we are good. The law, the Elections Act itself, says you have to show up with your ID and you, or your passport, the document oh. that you use to register. Mm. So it's not a matter of coming with your, your finger, just with your finger <laughs> and, and, and saying that. So that is one thing. Then there is the other element where you, you sit and watching news or reading the newspaper and then you see someone talking about a voter's card. When's the last time there are no voters anyone card. had a Yeah, so the ini haki yangu. Yes, so that's that. It's that. It's that kind of stuff that yeah. uh, you you're like. Okay, sometimes we just uh, use our networks. Mm. You just uh, put it out there that hey, in Kenya there's no voters card. All you need to do is your ID. It was a big debate in Parliament when when they removed that requirement for a voters mm -hmm. card, mm -hmm. and all. When the biometrics uh, register came at about 2010, or before the referendum, all you had was a slip, yes. an acknowledgement mm. slip, mm. Uh, which wasn't even required yeah. in okay. the voting. Okay, I want us now to move on and mm. we've, uh, conclude with this, yeah. uh, Koki, and this is to do with the blast in Manchester. Mm. And looking at how it was reported, one, uh, there were very few details at the beginning. I started hearing the yeah. story at about 4 a.m. on my way to work, and they would not give numbers of the dead. They would not. The language they would use is very different from. I would expect, you know, their scores dead. Yeah. For them, it would be uh, you know, verification. Yeah. Verification. Yeah, I think that is a public relations tactic where you basically delay information in crises. Mm. And uh, you, you, you keep on updating them. I can give you a good example with Kenya Airways. I think when there was uh, the, 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 the crash, uh, yeah, yeah. The Cameroon one. Cameroon yes. one, the second one. Yes. Uh, delayed information uh, reduces anxi anxiety and gives you, uh, uh, gives you time to compose yourself and tell stories in a certain manner. And that brings me to the the, the issue I wanted to raise about violence around this period and the importance of actually the media advocating for 
uh, and telling stories of violence. I have seen the media talk about women and uh, the violent incidences, uh, violent. I, I think mm. that is another cause that you have to pick on your own, mm. and you don't need anybody's advisory. You just need to say this is something we want to focus on. These are the issues we want to deal with. How can the public participate in ensuring that there are peaceful elections? Because peace starts with you and me. Mm. Yeah, but, uh, but the media will not you just, uh, talk about, again, uh, peace journalism, no. We are hoping that you will make people's levels awareness, I mean, awareness higher, so that they make the right decisions. Well, even as we talk about delaying news, maybe before yeah. um, Latif jumps into that, we're seeing a new trend in Kenyan media, where more media houses are embracing live coverage um, um, throughout the day, especially during this political period. Mm -hmm. And in most of these political rallies is where most of these incidences happen. Mm -hmm. And in the event, yes, delaying news will reduce anxiety, but in the event of a live event and somebody has said something and it's a bit too late uh, to take it back or take it off air, how do media houses go about that? I think basically you still don't tell uh, a story without the facts. You, you can say this has happened, but we are still in the process of verifying. You can take it off the off air mm. because of the, the, the kind of trauma. Nature. Yeah, uh, such a features. Uh, mm. I remember in 1998, I mean, during the, uh, for mm. those who were born, <laughs> during <laughs> the bomb blast, I mean, we were so we're traumatized. Born, I walked <laughs> from where to go see, you know, we don't have to create that kind of uh, scene initially mm. before we verify. All right, uh, Eric, your closing comments. And, and, and also auguring on how the Manchester blast was reported and the fact that facts were being delayed until they're verified. I think we didn't even get the name of the suicide bomber until almost, what, maybe eight, nine hours after. Yes, yes. and it had to come from the official source themselves. Yes. We're not saying that the police have told us. That the police had to first announce and then we carry the story later. And I think these are the lessons that you keep uh, seeing from international media in such incidences that they, they sort of fall back. And they're like, OK, so this is a big event. Uh, it's a big, uh, distressing piece of news. So we are going to go back and, and say we will take information from the relevant sources. Now, of course, those relevant sources are also working very hard at, and, and are very good at uh, communicating with the media and updating the public and all. So it's, we still are a developing media in, in yeah. this country. Mm -hmm. But these are key lessons that we need to learn and key lessons that need to be actually uh, debates that need to be had and discussions that need to be had. For example, the Editors Guild and people sitting down and deciding this is how we should try and cover this. The Media Council has done a lot of work in trying to, mm. you know, bring this to the fore. How do you actually re relay news in, in such an event of an emergency? But um, the, the case of Manchester and the cases of Paris and everywhere else, if you look at how they report, something that happens that they just say there's a blast. Okay. They do not tell you there's a terrorist attack. Mm. Yeah. It's a blast. Mm. And then they tell you uh, scores are injured. And then they start saying some deaths are feared. Mm. By the time they start it's saying... It's gradual. It's yeah. gradual. Mm. You know, and, and gradual we, we just need to learn. We, we just need to learn that. To that, the, that the thing of running is a big yeah. <laughs> blast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the one that has the biggest we should chill out. red burner. You should chill out as media. All right, thank you very much. Because of time, we'll have to wind up right there. Koki Ching, who is a lecturer at USIU with media and, for media and journalism. Uh, thank you for joining us. Eric Latif, a journalist. And last but not least, Alphonse Shiundu, who is from the Kenya editor for Africa check that is the newsroom but before we take a short break now there is breaking news three police officers have died today in a bomb attack in Kulan area of Garissa County the three were in a group of six officers patrolling Kulan two others suffered injuries and are being treated in Kulan dispensary the attack is suspected to have been carried out by Al Shabaab militants happened at 5 a.m. we shall give you more details shortly as we receive it now that uh, breaking news, uh, just a repeat of it. Three police officers have died today in a bomb attack in Kulan area of Garissa County. The three were in a group of six officers on a patrol in Kulan. Two others suffered injuries and are being treated in Kulan dispensary. The attack is suspected to have been carried out by Al-Shabaab militants and it happened at 5 a.m. More details coming up shortly. We're taking a break right here on Morning Express, but that story and more coming up right here as we continue with Morning Express.